Hello and welcome to Lecture 9 of Foundations of Artificial Intelligence. Today we're going to continue on the topic of knowledge representations. In particular, we're going to learn about different knowledge organization systems, and then we'll focus in particular on ontologies. In our last lecture, we talked a bit more about knowledge representations in general, and then we turned our focus to semantic networks, frames, scripts, and some other semantic network related representations. In today's lecture, we're going to start by covering some different knowledge organization systems, including folksonomies, controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, and thesauri. Then we'll take a look at a more formal knowledge organization system, the ontology, with particular focus on medical ontologies. Then we'll explore one of the most popular biological ontologies, the gene ontology, or Go. Then we'll look at how Go can be used to conduct functional annotation. And then we'll end by talking about some other specific medical ontologies. Let's start by looking at the broader concept of a knowledge organization system. These are also known as concept systems or concept schemes. A knowledge organization system is basically a way to represent organized knowledge. Here we see a handful of knowledge organization systems laid out from simplest and least formal to more complex and more formally defined. Here we have a folksonomy, a controlled list, a taxonomy, a thesaurus, and an ontology. Now let's briefly define a variety of knowledge organization systems. A folksonomy, otherwise known as collaborative tagging, is basically just a set of free text tags. A controlled vocabulary mandates the use of a community-agreed set of authorized terms. This is in contrast to natural language vocabularies, which doesn't really have any formal restrictions. Next we have a taxonomy. This is just a hierarchical arrangement of concepts. Notably, taxonomies often serve as the backbone for ontologies. Then we have the sori. These establish relationships between words. For example, synonyms, homonyms, and antonyms. The sori are often combined with taxonomies. Next we have the ontology. Starting from a taxonomy, an ontology adds semantics for concepts. Ontologies often include more relationship types and have more specifics laid out in terms of how they function. Lastly, we'll mention a semantic web. This will be covered in more detail in our next lecture. Briefly, a semantic web seeks to link the semantics of terms across the World Wide Web. This brief overview ranks these knowledge organization systems from limited to increased semantic value. Let's take a quick look at some visual representations of some of these knowledge organization systems. Here's a controlled vocabulary, which is basically just a list of controlled terms. A taxonomy brings in a hierarchy of relationships, such as is a. The sori, on the other hand, tend to focus on relationships that describe connections between like or unlike terms. And we can see when it comes to ontologies, a much broader range of relationships can be defined connecting different objects or terms. Now let's take a closer look at folksomonies. Here we're trying to crowdsource the identification of online content with tags. This is usually done in a fairly unstructured manner. For example, we could have people across the internet providing tags to pictures or videos or topics of discussion or really anything that might benefit from some sort of label. By tagging such items with terms, it makes it easier for people to find the resources they're looking for. Looking closer at a controlled vocabulary, this is an attempt to provide a standardized and consistent set of terms. The goal here is to aid a searcher in finding relevant information, also to reduce the ambiguity in human language, and controlled vocabularies are usually created and edited by some governing body. It's the role of this body to introduce new terms, phase out old ones, and add new mappings for concepts. One example of a controlled vocabulary is the medical subject headings, or MeSH. This vocabulary is used in PubMed or Ovid to search Medline databases. If you want to learn more, there's a link here. Some immediate problems with controlled vocabularies is that they're a lot of work. In other words, they're difficult and time-consuming to maintain. Further, determining what goes into or doesn't go into a controlled vocabulary can ultimately be very political. And ultimately, authors have freedom of choice when it comes to the terms they use, so there's no real way to enforce controlled vocabularies in many contexts. Now let's turn our attention to a taxonomy. Taxonomies involve is-a relationships that are organized as a hierarchy. They support classification, categorization, and concept organization. Here's the classic taxonomy of biological life. Next, a closer look at the sori. This is basically a taxonomy, or a hierarchy of terms, 
but they're enriched with new types of relationships and their meanings. Here, it's not necessary to structure all concepts or terms into a limited number of top-level hierarchies. In other words, the thesauri could be arranged as a set of distinct, independent hierarchies. You can think of a thesauri as a type of semantic network. Again, they can include relationships between classes and superclasses, or subclasses, using the is-a relationships, but they can also lay out a number of other relationships. Here's a quick example of a thesauri. This should look familiar to the semantic networks we covered in our last lecture. Here we have a central node with arcs describing different relationships to some terms and definitions. For instance, this node has a preferred label of economic cooperation, but an alternate label of economic cooperation with a hyphen. We also have an arc describing the definition of economic cooperation, in this case, including cooperative measures in banking, trade, industry, between and among countries. Beyond relationships with term labels and definitions, this thesauri also can have a hierarchy of is-a relationships. For example, subclasses of economic cooperation include the following connections. These include economic integration and industrial cooperation. Now let's shift gears and focus on ontologies. Let's briefly start by examining their origins. In philosophy, there's a fundamental branch of metaphysics that studies being or existence and their basic categories. It aims to find out what entities and types of entities exist. One could say that the idea of an ontology dates back to the 5th century BC when Empedocles divided the world into four basic elements, earth, fire, water, and air. Aristotle expanded on this idea towards trying to classify the components of life. Here we see an early idea to break down the connections between spirit, mineral, plant, beast, and human. Now let's break apart a modern definition of the ontology. It's defined as a formal, explicit specification of a shared conceptualization. The phrase formal specification speaks to the idea that we want something that's machine readable. In other words, it has meaning that the computer can understand and work with. The term explicit indicates that we want our terminology and definitions to be unambiguous. The use of the word shared here emphasizes that ontology is meant to be something that is commonly accepted and understood. Lastly, conceptualization. This refers to the conceptual model of a domain or the ontological theory. Basically here, this illustrates that ontology includes an abstract model and simplified view of some phenomenon in the world that we want to represent. Notably, many of the ideas from frames are now expressed in and used to implement ontologies, in particular the idea of object-oriented programming. Also of note, ontologies are designed to evolve and to be updated over time. This is because the world is dynamic, so there's always new things to include and new ways to look at how we organize information. Another important point is that most ontologies focus on a specific area to conceptualize. You can think of this as a subject thesauri. Lastly, there's not really any set discipline or methodology in terms of how ontologies are created, so there can still be quite a variety from ontology to ontology. In thinking about the structure of an ontology, most are structured as taxonomies or hierarchies, but they add semantics for concepts and to be able to add different kinds of relationships. This is something they inherit from semantic networks and frames. A basic ontology has two classes of elements, entities and the relationships between them. And when we put together ontologies, we try to organize them according to the axioms or rules that control how the world will be defined. Looking more closely at one of the main elements of ontologies, we have entities. Entities can be physical objects, a conceptual entity, or an event. Diving deeper into conceptual entities, these can include things like an organism attribute, a finding, an idea or concept, an occupation or discipline, organization, and so on. In biological ontologies, conceptual entities usually include ideas or concepts, functional concepts, or body systems. It's worth reiterating that an entity and a concept isn't strictly the same thing. Another way to break down entity types is to define them as continuance and occurrence. A continuant is a persistent object existing in time. Differently, an occurrent refers to parts which exist solely because of its existing at a certain time. There are two types of continuance. The first are independent continuance. These could refer to things like organisms, cells, or molecules. Next, we have dependent continuance. These can include things like roles, functions, or conditions, such as diseases. 
And lastly, occurrence can refer to things like processes, histories, or lives, which can describe the course of diseases. To connect this back with semantic networks, you can think of entities as being either classes or instances. Now let's look at a few other terms from the perspective of ontologies. The first is precision. This describes whether a term identifies exactly one concept. In other words, is it avoiding ambiguity? Then we have the expressiveness of an ontology. This examines whether the representation language allows the formulation of very flexible statements. Next, we have the idea of descriptors for concepts. Basically, there should be a one-to-one -one mapping between a term and the associated concept and vice versa. Ultimately, we want our ontology to have both high precision and high expressiveness. This is not the case for natural languages in general. You might come across the phrase parasitic interpretation. This indicates that there is an implied meaning that is not necessarily specified in an ontology. Now let's look at the role of ontologies. Well, mainly they are meant to provide a language which allows a group of people to share information reliably in a chosen area of work. They seek to define explicit assumptions for a domain so that it's easier to exchange domain assumptions, there's more flexibility to change or update the assumptions, and it's easier to interpret and update legacy data, or data that was collected a long time ago. Ontologies also seek to provide more precise definitions of resources and to make them more suitable for machine processing. Some general applications of ontologies include annotation and enrichment analysis, data harmonization, and inference. Some other areas of application include indexing, knowledge sharing and reuse, artificial intelligence in general, enterprise modeling, software design, molecular biology, and e-commerce. So what's the motivation for developing and using biomedical ontologies? When it comes to research, there's a massive amount of data being generated of various types and quantities coming out of both clinical research and basic science research. Data can come in the form of genetic variants, pathway information, diseases, phenotypes, and a huge variety of omics data. In order to integrate this data and gain a holistic perspective of how the data influences the things we're trying to understand, it's ultimately useful to have a way to standardize terms and their meanings, as well as relationships. This is what makes ontology so integral to biomedical research. The National Center for Biomedical Ontology, or the NCBO, hosts the BioPortal, which is the world's most comprehensive repository of biomedical ontologies. As of 2019, there's over 800 different biomedical ontologies included. Here's a link if you want to check it out in more detail. Here are some of the most commonly used ontologies, including the Current Procedural Terminology, or CPT, the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities, or MEDRA, which we'll learn a bit more about later in this lecture, the Drug Vocabularies Ontology, or RxNorm, which we'll also talk about a bit more later, and the best-known Gene Ontology, or GO, which we'll focus on here in the next section. The Open Biomedical Ontologies, or OBO, is an umbrella project for grouping different ontologies in the biological or biomedical fields. This includes a repository for ontologies with a defined set of standards. Ultimately, this is an effort to create controlled vocabularies for shared use across different biological and medical domains. The OBO forms a central element of the NCBO BioPortal. The OBO Foundry is a collaborative experiment with a group of ontology developers. Their goal is to advance the adoption of a growing set of principles specifying best practices in ontology development. If you want to learn more about the OBO Foundry, there's this link here. Now let's take a closer look at one of the most popular biological ontologies, the gene ontology, or GO. As you probably know, there's been an explosion of biological and biomedical data much of it coming from elements of the central dogma, including DNA, RNA, mRNA, and protein. A variety of technologies have fueled this data explosion, such as microarrays that allow us to examine gene expression, and next-generation sequencing that allows us to look at the specific genetic variant of DNA, RNA, mRNA, and beyond. Within any of these different omics analyses, we can conduct association studies and identify significant variables that are associated with the outcomes we're interested in studying. However, what's the next step after we've come up with these lists in terms of trying to understand what's going on in the underlying biology? Often we might not know the function of many of the genes or other variables that would end up in these lists. 
Well, this is one area that an ontology can have a big impact. Let's take a quick high-level look at how an ontology can play a role in addressing this aforementioned issue. Starting with an ontology, we can conduct what's called functional annotation. Here we try and connect the genes or variants in our lists with standardized terms from our ontology for which there's been previous evidence to make that connection or that association. Once these links have been made, we can conduct an enrichment analysis, basically asking if whether within our gene set we see different ontological terms overrepresented beyond what we'd expect by random chance. From an enrichment analysis, we can hope to derive new biological insights, taking a higher level look at the meaning behind our otherwise difficult to parse lists of significant findings. Armed with a basic idea of how we can use ontologies in research, let's take a closer look at the gene ontology, or GO. GO provides a way to capture biological knowledge for individual gene products in a written and computable form. It includes a set of concepts and the relationships to each other arranged as a hierarchy. Go has a controlled vocabulary of terms split into three related ontologies covering basic areas of molecular biology, including molecular function, biological process, and cellular component. Let's take a closer look at these three sub-ontologies. The first is molecular function, which include terms that are elemental activities or tasks or jobs. These can be things like protein kinase activity or insulin receptor activity. Next we have biological process. This group includes terms that describe a commonly recognized series of events. For example, cell division. Note here the difference between function and process, where a process has to have more than one distinct step. Lastly, we have cellular component. This is basically a term that describes where a gene product is located such as the mitochondrion, mitochondrial matrix, and mitochondrial inner membrane. As mentioned, the gene ontology is arranged as a set of three hierarchies. Here we see an illustration of terms organized within one of those sub-hierarchies, and notice again that they're arranged from less specific or more general to more specific or less general. The architecture of the gene ontology is that of a directed acyclic graph, or DAG. By a directed graph, we mean that there is a directionality between the relationships, and acyclic means that there are no directed cycles. In other words, there can be no loops going from higher in the tree to lower in the tree. Of note, there's this nice little application called Amigo that allows you to browse Go terms. You can find Amigo at this link. Here's what the Amigo page looks like. You can search for specific Go terms, such as synaptic transmission in this example. It will include basic information about that term, such as which of the three sub-ontologies it belongs to, synonyms, definition, and the location of this term within the hierarchy. Amigo also allows you to create a graphical view of the Go term relationships. One last point to mention is that the gene ontology is managed by the Go consortium. This consortium is responsible for having created the ontology, continuing to annotate genes within the ontology, developing tools to create, maintain, and use ontologies in general, and they lead efforts to include information from multiple species, conduct careful curation, make predictions on new annotations, and develop new tools for the future. Now let's revisit the idea of functional annotation using Go. First off, let's define functional annotation. Functional annotation can also be referred to as functional classification or functional data. The idea here is to attach biological information to genomic elements. It's traditionally focused on function assigned to the gene product. However, regulatory annotation is becoming increasingly prevalent. Again, an ideal functional annotation uses a controlled vocabulary, is high throughput so that you can annotate lots of variables quickly, and it's accessible. So why again do we care about functional annotation? Well, first off, the term functional genomics is a field of molecular biology that attempts to describe gene, RNA transcript, and protein functions and interactions. Functional annotation plays a key role in functional genomics. It basically allows us to take a large laundry list of genes or proteins and turn them into biologically useful hypotheses. The, term, the broader term gene annotation includes both functional annotation and structural annotation. Structural annotation focuses on the identification of genomic elements. For example, open reading frames, gene structures, coding regions, and the location of regulatory motifs. In contrast, functional annotation 
aims at attaching biological information to genomic elements. This includes biochemical function, biological function, whether it's involved in regulation and interactions, and its expression. There are two primary sources of functional annotations themselves. The first is based on direct experimental evidence of function, and the second involves indirect evidence of function. Direct evidence can include experiments in the target organism, such as enzyme assays, binding experiments, pathway analysis, functional complementations, synthetic lethals, gene mutations, and so on. Indirect evidence of function can come from expression analysis, structure analysis, or sequence analysis. Basically here, using these types of analyses to infer likely functionality. Ultimately, we want our functional annotations to be as accurate and comprehensive as possible. However, many genes and proteins don't have annotations to begin with. And for some, we don't even know their functions. So how do we achieve maximal functional annotation? Well, for one, we can read scientific research papers, basically manually looking for associations between genes, gene products, and functional terms for the ontology. However, this can be extremely time consuming. Another way is to take a more automated approach. Specifically, we can search for homologs or orthologs of known function to help assign predicted function. Let's briefly review the difference between homologs, orthologs, and paralogs. Homolog is the more general term and describes a relationship between genes separated by the event of speciation or genetic duplication. Both orthologue and paralogs are types of homologs. An orthologue refers to homologous genes in different species that evolve from a common ancestor gene by speciation. Normally, but not always, these homologous genes retain the same function over the course of evolution. The identification of orthologs is critical for the reliable prediction of gene function in newly sequenced species. A paralog, on the other hand, refers to homologous genes related by a duplication within a genome. Paralogs can often evolve new functions, even if these are related to the original one. Here's an illustration trying to depict the difference between orthologs and paralogs. Red squares indicate a duplication node, while blue squares indicate a speciation node. At the top, we have a speciation event, where H1 and M1 are homologous genes in these two different species. These genes would said to be orthologs. Below it, we have a duplication event, where a homologous gene is duplicated within the same genome, i.e. the same species. These genes are considered paralogs. We'll briefly discuss some different tools that you can use to search for these types of orthologies. For example, there's BLAST, which is a sequence alignment search tool, MPSearch, which is a sequence comparison tool. You can also conduct domain analysis, or the analysis of regions of sequence homology among sets of proteins that are not all full-length homologs. And also you can turn to protein family databases, such as COG and KOG. Here you can search for super or subfamilies, where a superfamily is a complete set of proteins having sequence homology over essentially their full length. And differently, subfamily is a complete set of homologous proteins, which yet encompass proteins of a diverse function. To date, Go is the most widely used standard for functional annotation of gene products across all species. Notably, Go annotation does not rely on completed genome sequences of a species. As we've seen, Go's functional annotation is based on both orthology and direct experimental evidence. While computational methods are fast, there's a trade-off between quality and quantity. On the other hand, functional literature search for experimental evidence is really slow, but gives you the highest quality annotations. Further, Go allows a more detailed functional analysis, given that it includes over 24,000 unique terms. This is in contrast to ontologies like COG and KOG, which only include 25 broad terms. When applying Go annotations, they're given to the most specific or lowest level possible. Such annotations rely on the true path rule. Basically, an annotation at a term implies annotation to all of its parent terms. For example, if we annotate a gene product with the Go term pepsidase regulatory activity, there's an implied annotation to everything above it in the hierarchy. Go annotations are also given with an evidence code. For example, the following. IDA indicates that the annotation was inferred by a direct assay. TAS indicates the annotation is traceable to an author statement. ISS indicates the annotation was inferred by sequential similarity. 
and IEA indicates the annotation was electronic. So where do you go to get these Go annotations that have already been established? Well, there's a link here where you can go ahead and download all Go annotations. Notably, there's a collaborating institution per organism that provides these annotations. Most of the Go annotations come from the Universal Protein Resource, or Uniprot. Also of note, most of the annotations are electronic. As of 2012, over 98% of all Go annotations were inferred computationally, not manually by curators. In order to retrieve your functional annotations, you'll need the following. The name of your species, a taxonomy ID, the database from which you want to draw these annotations, and gene identifiers to connect your genes to their respective functional annotations. Notably, not all functional annotations for species will necessarily be in one database. And not many species have a broad coverage of Go annotation. However, when needed, you can go about searching for homologs to fill in some of those blanks, or you can laboriously turn to manual annotation from the literature if it's both practical and the information you're looking for is available. Another quick note is that gene identifiers are platform-specific, where different technologies and companies have their own set of unique identifiers. So ultimately, you may need some way to map how your genes are labeled to a gene identifier that is used with a specific functional annotation resource. Another thing to note is that not all terms within the gene ontology have the same level of functional annotation quality. This figure attempts to depict that point. On the y-axis, we have the fraction of electronic annotations confirmed experimentally. This gets at the reliability of the annotations within the respective Go term. On the x-axis, we have the fraction of experimental annotations previously electronically predicted. This attempts to capture the completeness of the functional annotations for a Go term. We can see from this figure that there's quite a diversity of Go term annotation quality. Notice that the color of the circles corresponds to the three sub-hierarchies found within Go. We'll wrap up this discussion of functional annotation by describing some other resources you can use to do it. For example, there are different pathway databases, including KEG, Reactome, and Biocarta. There are gene set databases. For example, in addition to gene ontology, we have the Molecular Signatures Database, or MSIGDB. But there are also other resources out there that annotate based on genes sharing a motif or being regulated by the same protein or microRNA, or genes found on the same chromosome. At the end of the day, any grouping that's biologically sensible could be applied to conduct functional annotation. Lastly of note, there's this resource, David, which is a collection of annotation databases. However, the last time I checked, this is not still being updated regularly. In the last section of our lecture, we'll talk about some other medical ontologies. The first is MEDRA, which stands for the Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities. This is a rich and highly specific standardized medical terminology to facilitate sharing of regulatory information internationally for medical products used by humans. Here's a schematic that tries to describe what is included within MEDRA versus what is not. So MEDRA includes terms related to diseases, diagnoses, signs, symptoms, medical and surgical procedures, and so forth. Things that are not included in MEDRA include drug names, patient demographic terms, clinical trial study design terms, and severity descriptors. Again, notice how this is an ontology that has a fairly restricted domain of what it does and does not cover. MEDRA is organized as a hierarchy of five different levels of generalization. At the top, we have the most general group, called system organ class. This highest level is distinguished by anatomical, physiological system, etiology, or purpose. Below system organ class, we have the following categories, high level group term, high level term, preferred term, and lowest level term. Here we show those five levels again with two different examples of terms that could be found in the hierarchy. For example, here on the left, the highest level is a gastrointestinal disorder. A connected term the level below could be a gastrointestinal signs or symptoms. Below this, the more specific idea of nausea and vomiting symptoms. Below that, nausea, and finally, feeling queasy. As an example of how MEDRA could actually be applied, I'm going to talk briefly about a research project that I was involved with. The goal of this project was to harmonize data sets across a set of clinical trials targeting arterial hypertension. In these clinical trial data sets, we had information about adverse events, which are undesirable experience observed in a trial, as well as information about medical history, 
which refers to the medical diagnoses or symptoms prior to the trial. Our goal is to harmonize or standardize both of these types of information by using a single standard of terminology. The ultimate goal of integrating the samples across all of these different clinical trials was to ultimately yield a larger data set where we'd have an improved power to find associations between the predictive elements and the outcome we we're interested in studying. However, it turns out that harmonizing terms is extremely challenging for a number of reasons. First off, realize that there's usually human beings manually entering this information as it's collected. As a result, there were spelling errors, typos, truncations of terms, plurality, in other words, headaches instead of just headache, the use of slang or abbreviations, the use of terms that weren't found within Medra, different ways of phrasing the same concepts, or the use of terms that were in an older version of Medra but not in the most up-to-date one. All of these were barriers in terms of mapping the text variables that we started with in our clinical trials to an ultimately harmonized final data set that used a terminology standard. At the lowest level of term specification, Medra has almost 70,000 unique terms. Within our clinical trial data sets to be harmonized, we had over 20,000 unique adverse event text entries and over 21,000 unique medical history text entries. Here's an overview of our approach to conduct this harmonization. Our informatics pipeline began by harmonizing the lowest level term. We began by automating a search for exact matches. These were the easy terms to harmonize. Next, we applied fuzzy matching, which I'll describe in the next slide. This automated process basically gives us a best guess of what might be the most appropriate match between the term in our data set and the term in our ontology standard. Lastly, we had a clinical expert use the results of fuzzy matching to verify or complete any annotations that couldn't be determined through exact matching. After we'd fully mapped these lowest level terms, we then went on to impute the hierarchy of more general Medro terms. In other words, for every lowest level term, we wanted to map it to each more general term above it within the Medra hierarchy. The main reason for doing this was to try and improve power in downstream analysis. Imagine for a moment that we're only evaluating the lowest level terms and looking at their association with some outcome of interest. There are so many possible unique terms that it's unlikely that we'd have any statistical power to detect an association. However, by analyzing more generalized versions of the terms, we can expect more power to detect associations. Starting with the lowest level terms, we first mapped them to the preferred terms. Then in sequence, we mapped preferred terms to high level terms, high level terms to high level group terms, and finally high level group terms to system organ classes. Looking a little bit deeper at this informatics pipeline, exact matching was conducted by first removing any spaces from the text in terms that we were trying to map, and then we conducted our matching using a case insensitive method in Python called casefold. This allows us to look for matches between our original text and the Medra term without worrying about capitalization differences. Once exact matching was done, we moved on to fuzzy matching for all the remaining terms. As you might infer, fuzzy matching attempts to match text that isn't exactly the same as our target, and instead attempts a best approximation of a match. I'll tell you right now that this example makes it look a lot easier than this is in practice. Our first attempt at fuzzy matching used a method called soundex. This basically attempted to take text and encode it phonetically, so that if something sounds the same, it would be a stronger match. However, in a very complex and diverse biomedical terminology domain, this ended up being wildly insufficient. In other words, we were getting lots of matches that didn't make any sense at all. So next we turn to a package in Python called Fuzzy Wuzzy. Fuzzy Wuzzy has a few strategies available to try and rank and score potential fuzzy matches between texts that don't rely on a phonetic encoding. In our work, we ultimately found that this was much more effective in our biomedical domain. Let's move on from Medra to a different medical ontology called RxNorm. This ontology normalizes names for clinical drugs. It also links these names to many of the drug vocabularies commonly used in pharmacy management and drug interaction software. By providing links between these vocabularies, RxNorm can mediate messages between systems not using the same software or vocabulary. Here we can see some drug names in RxNorm. They have connections to specific drug ingredients, and these ingredients are part of more general drug classes. Here's an illustrated sample of the RxNorm ontology presented basically as a semantic network. 
Notice that there are relationships such as has ingredient or ingredient of. In this case, Zyrtec has the ingredient citerized hydrochloride. If you're interested, RxNorm also has this nifty browser to explore the ontology called RxNav. I've also gotten a chance to use RxNorm in that same collaboration I talked about earlier. Again, in that study, our goal was to harmonize data across clinical trials of arterial hypertension. But in this case, we were seeking to harmonize concomitant medications. These were prescription medications, over-the-counter drugs, or dietary supplements that a study participant takes in addition to the drug under investigation. Again, our goal was to harmonize these CONMEDs using a standardized terminology. In this case, that standardized terminology came from the ontology RxNorm. In working with RxNorm, there were a few additional challenges beyond the ones we noted when we talked about before when we used Medra to harmonize adverse events in medical history. For example, drug names differed based on whether they came from different countries or companies. Additionally, some drugs include multiple ingredients that needed to be broken apart as separate matches. And there were also discrepancies in terms of dose, in other words, what units were used to describe dose and what would be considered a normal dose. Moving on from RxNorm, we'll briefly talk about SNOMED CT. This stands for SNOMED Clinical Terms. SNOMED CT is a computer processable collection of medical terms, providing codes, terms, synonyms, and definitions used in clinical documentation and reporting. It seeks to encode the meanings that are used in health information and to support the effective clinical recording of data with the aim of improving patient care. SNOMED CT provides the core general terminology for electronic health records. These include terms for clinical findings, symptoms, diagnoses, procedures, body structures, organisms and other etiologies, substances, pharmaceuticals, devices, and specimens. Here's an illustration of SNOMED CT and its components. If you're interested, feel free to check this out in more detail. Here's a summary of what we've covered in today's lecture. We started by talking about knowledge organization systems in general, diving a little bit into folksonomies, controlled vocabularies, taxonomies, and thesauri. Next, we moved to focus on ontologies. We learned what they are, concepts, structures, and applications, and a little bit about medical ontologies in general. Next, we learned about one of the most popular biological ontologies, that of the gene ontology, or GO. We learned what it's comprised of, and we learned a bit about how it's maintained. Next, we explored how GO could be used to conduct functional annotation. We learned the role of ontologies in annotation, and how this can be leveraged to gain new biological hypotheses and insights. Lastly, we took a tour of a few other popular medical ontologies, including Medra, RxNorm, and SNOMED CT. Just a reminder, the midterm paper summaries are due soon. Please check the syllabus for the specific date. As always, thank you for your attention, and I'll see you in the next lecture.